are somebody's legacy and their personal archive. As they say, someone's wildest dream. Although some people think our communities are fractured, sometimes we know our richness, if you know what I mean. But baby, remember, things ain't always what they seem. When things get hard on your journey, remember it's your birthright, your inheritance. You are the special one chosen by the ancestors to do this. You don't own it, but it's your responsibility, the dreams. Behold, let them talk about your decisions, your strange visions. Don't fold, hold your head up high, and just know they're levitating. You're soaring through the sky. To God be the glory, don't ask why. Keep fighting, creating, contemplating, unpacking and restacking your family history. It's no mystery you made it this far. Your grandmother prayed for you, but you were in God's hands before you arrived. She prayed over your mother's womb. These stories you would discover, you find with so much inspiration and so much pride. Show the world the miseducation of the Negro. The narratives are the lie. Baby, go on ahead and shine. Don't forget whose you are and who you are. Still looking for freedom. <laughs> Still trying to find the North Star. These are migration stories, y'all. Can you hear me? They are the long-winded, extended remix to 10 generations, the country's fortitude, human libation. Black people are the church of this nation. The black exodus, y'all waiting and watching Netflix, but this life is really us in real time. Keep sharing, keep speaking your stuff. Please don't give up. Hey, this is the greatest migration, y'all. Shout out to Mississippi, Alabama, and Arkansas. Be proud of who you are, that your people worked hard. Without the courage and sacrifice, hmm, you wouldn't be who you are. Work on that performative nature. You're truly a star. Hmm. And that nose in the sky, that pretense. Remember the long journeys. Remember Chicago, Detroit, and Memphis. We come from everywhere. Sturdy foundations need support, strength, grace, and care. <laughs> These are migration stories. It's the anger, it's the joy, it's the genetics you avoid. It's wondering what's in your DNA. It's summers down south, it's God and his people every day. <laughs> it's Henrietta Lacks in your cells and your veins, it's Sarah Bartman and eating your bodies in modern day. It's a hug in the church aisle. Free greens, fresh greens on the stove. It's fried chicken laying on brown paper bags. It's laying your head in grandmama's lap when you feel sad. It's the clothing line in the backyard. It's your healing, your trauma wounds for what they lacked. It's encountering your memories of the diaspora. <laughs> and that's a fact. I'm reminiscing on a time when Negroes, by any means necessary, remain black. Migration stories again, y'all. Can you hear me? It's the season of discovery because someone got up and packed. It's the history of your authentic self. <laughs> it's the history of your authentic self without shame or personal attack. Now, this continuum of, of, of these wild dreams and now they've become a dream deferred. Who's, gate, who's the gatekeeper of your reality? The migration now is showing up beyond the world of 3D. The legacy, a movement in every direction. Welcome home, kinfolk. Thank you, Janine Collins, for that stirring poem. We are so grateful for such a graceful opening of veneration for all of the shoulders on which we stand. I'm Jessica Bell Brown, Curator of Contemporary Art here at the BMA and co-curator of A Movement in Every Direction, Legacies of the Great Migration, which is on view now through January 29th next year. I wanna thank my colleagues Tracy Beal and Sabina Diaz-Ramal for their superb planning and facilitation of tonight's event 
and staff across our AV visitor services and facil facilities teams whose labor allows for us to gather with ease and attentiveness. We thank all of you for being here with us and for what I know will be a most special program. When we were thinking about this programmatic arm for the exhibition, our dream of dreams was to find a way to bring to life the archive and family histories and to unlock, with, to unlock the vastness and expansiveness of our ancestors' journeys and migrations. How do we preserve and share their legacies? We look to a few beacons of light this afternoon to share their pathways to this deep and important work. It's my hope that their projects and the exhibition upstairs will empower each and every one of you to bring to light these conversations in your own families. Five artists, archivists, and shepherds of history will share the stage tonight, illuminating the power of their family legacies. So moderating this afternoon's discussion is Janine Collins, who shared with us that beautiful, beautiful poem of welcome. She is not only a supreme poet and writer, she's a community artist currently in her second year as a community arts fellow with the Inheritance Baltimore Billy, Billy Holiday Center for Liberation Arts at Johns Hopkins University. She spent the last year collecting oral histories and facilitating intergenerational events throughout Baltimore, working with storyteller, griot, BCPS, English teacher, 46 years, and elder in residence, Charlie Duggar, as well as writer, producer, and educator, Dee Watkins. Currently, Janine is continuing her cohort collaboration with postdocs, historians, archivists, and librarians, specifically to create art and programming situated in the archives. Her most recent project is a multidisciplinary installation of walk and walk of remembrance honoring the black ancestors of the JHU Homewood campus. She believes that archives transform the power of community and that, quote, your inheritance becomes your legacy, end quote. Savannah Wood is an artist with deep roots in Baltimore and Los Angeles. Wood primarily works in photography, text, and installation to explore how spirituality, domesticity, and other relationships to place shape our, our identities. Wood is also the executive director of Afro Charities, where she is creating infrastructure to increase access to the 130-year-old Afro-American newspaper's extensive archives. Wood is a graduate cum laude of the University of Southern California, a 2022 Saul Zentz Innovation Fund Fellow, a Creative Capital Finalist in 2022, and from 2019 to 2021, the Robert Deutsch Foundation Fellow. So like four generations of ancestors before her, she lives and works in Baltimore, Maryland, sharing and preserving black stories. Larry Cook. Larry W. Cook is an interdisciplinary artist working across photography, video, and mixed media. Cook received his MFA from George Washington University and his BA in photography from SUNY Plattsburgh. He has exhibited his work nationally at the Kemper, MoMA PS1, the National Portrait Gallery, and internationally at the Schiefzeyen in Germany and the 2022 Venice Biennale. His work is included in public collections such as MoMA, Harvard, art museums, the BMA, and other institutions. And he's a brilliant assistant professor at Howard University. Jalisa Bloomberg, Bloomberg, excuse me. Jalisa Bloomberg is a, trans, is a transdisciplinary designer and researcher with a focus on architecture and lighting based in Brooklyn. Well, now based in Baltimore. <laughs> She's an adjunct assistant professor at Columbia University's Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation, and a core member of Dark Matter University. She holds a master's of architecture and an MFA in lighting design from the New School, Parsons School of Design in New York, along with a BFA in design from UT Austin. She's the creative director of the Black Baltimore Digital Database. And lastly, but certainly not least, Webster Phillips III, who is maintaining the photojournalist tradition of his father, Irving H. Phillips Jr., who worked with and for the Baltimore Sun, and his grandfather, I. Henry Phillips Sr., who worked for the Afro-American, producing an artistic gra graphic body of work out of the Balt out of, about Baltimore of his generation. In 2008, he began scanning his grandfather's four by five black and white negatives, and currently has over 10,000 photographs in their database. 
During the pandemic, he began virtual ID sessions with elders to identify unknown people and places in the archives. He's focused on embracing the digital age and making the I. Henry Phillips collection available online and accessible for educational purposes. So without further ado, I'd love for you to help me in welcoming our participants and panelists to this evening or this afternoon. Jaleesa, Webster, Savannah, Janine, Larry. Please come to the stage, thank you. My name is Savannah Wood, and um, as Jess just mentioned, I'm the executive director of Afro Charities. Um, Afro Charities partners with the 130-year-old Afro-American newspapers to preserve their archives and to make them more accessible to the public through artistic and educational programming. Um, and these are my great-great-grandparents, John Henry Murphy Sr. and Martha Elizabeth Howard Murphy. Both of them were born enslaved here in Maryland. John Murphy is widely recognized as the founder of the Afro, and he was certainly involved with the paper in its earliest iterations. But it wasn't until 1897, five years after it was founded, that he purchased the name and a printing press at an auction with $200 from his wife, Martha. When I first decided to move back to Baltimore in 2019 to think about this archive and this legacy, the photo on the right was the clearest image that I'd ever seen of Martha. I barely even knew her name at the time. Like many women, the record of her contributions to the world were a little fuzzier and not quite in focus. Once I learned about her investment in the paper, I became increasingly curious about who she was and how, as a formerly enslaved woman in the late 1800s, she was able to give her husband what would have been about $7,000 today to go after a dream. Once I finally got to Baltimore, I was able to access the Afro archives and found this image. A clearer portrait for sure, but still missing some nuance thanks to the hand-painted touch-ups that, that the Afro's photo editor added to create contrast for when the image would eventually be reproduced in the newspaper. As I continued to get more familiar with the collection, I noticed an archival box unlike the other standard banker boxes that lined the shelves. When I opened it, there was a scrapbook inside with yet a clearer image of Martha nestled within a robust obituary that detailed her many accomplishments throughout her life. She was a founding member of Baltimore's colored YWCA and its president for nearly 20 years. She had 10 children. She was an advocate for women's suffrage. And in those details, I also learned that her father, who was also born enslaved, died a wealthy landowner in Montgomery County. I kept digging, ultimately learning that the land he owned was land that his wife had been enslaved on. And today, that land is owned by the state of Maryland, meaning it's technically public and accessible. I just needed to figure out how to get there. So I followed the citations in publicly available state records and was led to Eric Ledbetter at Maryland's Department of Natural Resources. He shared that they had just begun an application for funding to build a trail to the site and to restore one of the two homes there, both in various states of disrepair. They would also clear the brush from the family cemetery where Martha's parents, brother, and other relatives were buried. And as an aside, um, I'm still looking for an image of Martha's mother. Uh, this is her husband here, but we've never seen an image of her. In the early days of the pandemic, this land became a refuge for me and a place to safely convene with close friends, family, and ancestors alike. The more I read about the land and my family, the more citations I would find that led me down new paths. At the Sandy Springs Slave Museum, I met Sandy Williams, who told me that we were cousins and that we had 300 more cousins who were all on Facebook in a group together um, including descendants of two of Martha's cousins who had escaped Maryland on the Underground Railroad and created new lives for themselves near the Niagara River in Ontario, Canada. 
The U.S. and Canadian branches of the family reconnected a little over 30 years ago and have been hosting family reunions ever since. I just didn't know about them. Since learning about this land in late 2019, I've been making images at the site. And in 2020, I produced a short film that debuted at an exhibition called Close Read here in Baltimore. This year, I'm working to expand that short to include interviews with cousins from our large familial diaspora in order to tell a more layered story about how we remember and how these legacies shape our choices in the present. Each time I connect with a new family member or have a new conversation with a close relative, Martha reveals herself to me more clearly. Here, face unretouched, or here, young with her sister Maria, and even here on eBay. <laughs> so obviously you know I had to buy that. Um, as I think about this legacy, I'm reminded of how important it is that we be intentional about how we tell our stories in the present and how we preserve what's important to us so that future generations will have something to work with even as we, as ancestors, lead them to more and more questions that they'll have to search the answers out for. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Larry Cook. I'm also one of the artists in the exhibition. Um, and I would like to talk a little bit about um, some of the images um, uh, that's part of my work. Uh, I'll let my testimony sit next to yours. So specifically the archival images and the portrait of my dad. So this first uh, slide is an image of my second great-grandfather and grandmother, James H. Cook, and Minnie Pearson, um, her maiden name. Both born in 1880 in Fairfield, South Carolina, um, James, one of nine siblings, uh, grew up as a, a farmer. An uh, interesting fact is that um, the Pearsons and the Cooks uh, lived in the same township about two minutes apart. So I would like to think um, or imagine that they were childhood sweethearts. Um, you know, couldn't wait to, to get married at the age of 19. Uh, they would um, go on to have nine children. Um, I like to think about this, this studio portrait um, as this you know, document uh, kind of showing their bond together. Um, but it wouldn't, it would kind of take a, a, a drastic change um, kind of later on as they're raising their family. Um, and this is a oral story that's been passed down uh, within the family. Uh, so James gets into an altercation with the white gentleman in, in South Carolina. As a result, um, he then relocates to Augusta, um, Augusta, Georgia. Uh, during that process, um, he gains employment, and then wanting to reunite with his family, he writes to um, his wife, Minnie, who's still raising the family in South Carolina, uh, wanting them to, to relocate. Um, but Minnie never receives the letter. Um, the daughter receives the letter who is dating a gentleman at the time and in fear of their union being broken, decides not to give the letter to Minnie, um, leaving her disconnected from her husband and their family separated uh, and they never reunite. Um, as to how true this story is, um, we will never know. I like to accept it as truth, uh, but also kind of appreciate the fact that they chose to share this story and the power of oral stories and creating narratives to protect um, the honor and integrity of the family. So this next slide is of my great-grandfather, William James Cook Sr., who is known as Whist, born in 1905, 
who would later marry Estelle English in 1928. Um, they would go on to have nine children. Um, and while their, the older children were in their teens, they would relocate to Washington, D.C. And he worked as a contractor most of his life. Um, and I always kind of imagine not only the carriage it would take to leave his family to make a way for them in D.C., um, but also the anxiety of gathering the children and, and his wife together again, specifically with um, you know, having that separation and, and losing his dad to a degree. So if one of his children is my grandfather, William James Cook Jr., known as Hutt. He was born in 1928. Um, again, one of seven siblings. And uh, even though his father would go on to D.C., he would shortly follow after. Um, they would locate over Hanover Place in Washington, D.C. Now, it kind of begins a little complicated in terms of um, his history. He ended up having four children by three different women. One of those women, Mildred Best, um, who would pass shortly after the birth of my dad. As a result, um, Hutt would give my dad to his younger sister, baby sis, as they referred to her, who would raise my dad in her household with her husband. This photo was taken during Hutt's 57th birthday. He would later pass that year, um, a year before I was born. This is the only image of my dad and grandfather. So this brings me to um, a portrait that's included in the exhibition. The first and only portrait of my dad um, it marks a, a pivotal moment, not only in my career as a photographer, but also in our relationship, as it's kind of this document of reconciliation between me and my dad. Um, well, I like to think of it as a um, legacy portrait. Uh, and thinking about preserving legacies, um, oftentimes you have to recognize that you have one. And there has been this wall of, um, or this petition rather, that kind of blocked uh, my vision beyond our relationship. Kind of seeing this long history um, and legacy of men and women who have you know, worked hard and sacrificed so I could be here today. Uh, though this, is, this was the last, um, image and kind of the culmination of the project in the show, it also marks um, a beginning of a new journey as we uh, work towards a new narrative as it relates to father and son relationships. Thank you. Hello, I'm Jalisa. Um, okay. I'm thankful to be here. This summer, I was sent a call for essays about the Caribbean and decided to write about the Isthmus of Panama, where my mom is from. During a series of recent visits to Panama, I contemplated the complicated relationships between landscape, time, migratory archives, memory, and the colonial project that Panama is famous for. In attempting to articulate this contemplation, guided by excerpts from Poetics of Relation by Edward Glissant, I'll read a bit from this, my latest draft with images and sketches that I've been working through. Wait. Okay, so it's not the updated, that's all right. Starting with the quote from Edward Glissant, transparency no longer seems like the bottom of the mirror in which Western humanity reflected the world in its own image. There is opacity now at the bottom of the mirror, a whole alluvium deposited by populations Silts that is fertile, but in actual fact, indistinct and un unexplored even today. Denied or insulted more often than not, and with an insistent presence that we are incapable of not experiencing. Oh yeah, okay, the, the slides aren't updated, that's all right. The first narrative of the Isthmus is the story of its birth. Long before human activity in the American continents, 
The precise dates of these geological activities range within three and 23 million years ago, signaled by the end of marine life exchange. One ocean became two oceans. And the beginning of migration of flora and fauna across the continents known as the Great American Interchange. It's speculated that the emergence of the land bridge was the catalyst for the Ice Age. The isthmus emerged not linearly, but with massive tectonic forces from all directions. From satellite views, it takes the shape of action, a spiral, a swirl. This landscape follows the continental divide, which is the mountainous and hydrological divide that extends from the Bering Strait all the way down to the Strait of Magellan. At its thinnest, the isthmus is 38 miles across, ocean to ocean. It's at this point, the isthmus, it's at this point that the isthmus, that the, the linearity of the isthmus um, really challenges the cardinal, cardinal directions. And millions and millions of years later, humans desired to open this bridge again. It was first the Spanish in the 1500s who tried to traverse the landscape. After a failed attempt by the French in 1880, it was the US who took on the project to build the canal. The big stick policy, an extended sentiment from Manifest Destiny, was used throughout Latin America and the Caribbean as a tactic that relied on threat, not force, to, to leverage power in the willful eff effort to claim the global commercial trade market. During the construction of the railroad and the canal, tools, machinery, and materials were shipped from the northeast of the US, including 1.5 million tons of concrete from the Lehigh Valley, which is near New York. The, Chag the Chagres River was dammed, forest was cleared, and the continental divide was cut. This is known as the Culebra Cut. To remove 100 million cubic yards of mountain and earth, lowering the landscape at the most by 155 feet. In the political version of the story, the construction of the canal is described as a great adventure. Outside of the institutional and political stories, there are other fictions captured by the rhythmic tradition. There's a folk song in Portobello, a historic site of Maranage. A line that repeats in the song says, Diablo, tu no puedes conmigo, which means, devil, you can't with me. This refusal is expressed in a performance where someone dresses up as a devil with a mask and clothing, typically in red and black. The figure chases around other figures, describing the tale of various waves of colonization. In this fiction, from the perspective of a marginalized subject in the isthmus, hell came here. When I visited Panama last summer, it was the first time since my grandfather's funeral. He passed away in 2009 in, in Colón, Panama, where he was born in 1917. Colón, named after Christopher Columbus, is the name of the province and city on the Atlantic side of the isthmus. It's also the site of the second largest free trade zone in the world. My grandfather's parents came from Jamaica in the early 1900s, a part of the continued migration within the Caribbean associated with the labor and opportunity that the pa Panama Canal offered. Approximately 150,000 people migrated from Panama to Panama from throughout the West Indies between the years of 1904 and 1914. A lot of stories are lost in questionable data, but it's known that thousands died or were injured mainly due to, due to dis, dis, sorry, <laughs> mainly due to disease and precarious use of dynamite. In the canal zone, the US extended Jim Crow policies to the region, ironically named the silver and gold role, silver and gold being the main instigator for the industrialization of the region. One of my last memories of my grandfather alive was in Cologne, in the apartment that my mom and her sisters grew up in. I washed and scrubbed his feet on their balcony overlooking the Atlantic Ocean. For a few days, my brother and I took midday naps next to him in his king-size bed, all of us lazy from the tropical breeze that was always allowed into their house. As a young girl, one of my main memories, <laughs> one of my earliest memories in their apartment, um, I once saw a lizard running through the apartment and I screamed, expecting my grandpa to remove it. And he calmly said, let him pass. For his funeral, family flew in from various places, including New York, Texas, Jamaica. We gathered at the church he attended for most of his life. Like most memories, I have a collection of flash moments from that day. Audible crying, laughter, 
a range of dialects varying between Spanish, American English, Jamaican English, broken Spanish, broken English, hybrid, hybrid linguistics, soft smells of perfume, sweat, and wood. The lasting image in my memory is the soil, red and full of clay. In the heat of the tropics, watching his casket lower down, it's not the sounds of grief that stand out, but it's the intense red soil in the bright sun, perfectly rectangular in shape. Maybe it stands out because beyond the emotional, it was the specificity of this landscape that had us gathered together on the isthmus to honor his long life. After my grandmother's apartment sells, the plot of earth where he rests will be the last bit of the isthmus we occupy. In the Caribbean, one is always arriving and departing at once. This past June, I flew from Panama City to New York City with an extra suitcase containing a shoebox filled with family photos, my grandfather's Bible, and two glasses from a bar he owned with, with some friends for a bit of time in the 60s. In Texas, the rest of my grandmother's photos and documents are with her at my aunt's house. Transporting these sentimental materials in this way, the weight of their meaning feels delicate in my hands. I'm unsure what we'll do with them. At some point, these materials will lose their intimacy and become just material, but we will try to remember ourselves. Most diagrams of ancestral lineage rely on a tree, but these migratory fam familial archives describe something much more like a rhizome, a fugitive network below the Earth's surface. The isthmus, as small as it is, captures a dynamic and dense web of history and the continual folding of diaspora. If another life force came to Earth, they would find evidence of this entanglement. After poetry, language, and sentiment have faded, our evidence rests not just in concrete, but in soil and rivers, some lost at sea, again a part of the Earth's geography. And thinking critically from the scale of the immediate and the intimate, these narratives are not so indistinct. Thank you. <laughs> Lon Webster Phillips, um, third generation photographer from Baltimore. And um, I've been working for the past few decades um, with my grandfather and father's photographs. Uh, my father uh, began shooting for the Sun Papers. We came back from Vietnam around 1968. My grandfather shot for the better part of uh, 50 years, mostly from the early 40s to the um, mid, mid to late 90s when he passed. Um, like the powerful stories that, that you guys have just heard is proof of legacy and my proof of preserving legacy. And I feel like my job as far as preserving legacy is to get as many eyes on my grandfather's photos and my father's photos as possible because in this archive of thousands of images holds most likely the photo that might be maybe someone's only photo they might find of a family member. So. I'm gonna just kind of float through some images. This is um, Lionel Hampton in a store, um, kind of doing like an in-store, moving around. Um, so a lot of these images are images that we, we rarely show or haven't exhibited before. This is an image that always kind of struck me because in scanning 10,000 uh, negatives, I don't think maybe 5% have white folks in the images and it's usually a business transaction or something rare like this, um, which this seems like a community. Of course, creepy, uh, creepy clown involved, but uh, <laughs> some kind of, um, a few communities where you actually see uh, folks together. This is Drew Hill Park pool number two, which was the colored pool. Of course, these are probably friends that just want to swim with their other friends, but of course, we weren't allowed at pool number one, they were allowed at pool number two, so you'll see these spaces that were inhabited. Um, this is an image in, I'm not sure if it's a Y or if it's a school, a lot of times you would see um, churches that would have multi-purpose kind of rooms where we see everyone and I looked at this photo so many times and a friend of mine was asking me um, what I noticed about it and I was, you know, so many things crossed my mind but she was saying that they're holding that woman up on top, holding that girl up on top which was what struck her immediately and the beauty about a lot of these photos is 100 people can look at them and 100 people will see um, different things. This is uh, Hank Marin and um, Roy Campanella. 
a lot of images were kind of to the side and a lot of images were labeled. Only about a quarter of them were labeled. And so this was one of the ones that was kind of kept aside a little bit. Um, this is an image of Joe Lewis. Joe Lewis actually had a punch, Joe Lewis punch, which you see the kid kind of drinking right there uh, at the forefront um, that was uh, produced in Baltimore for a while. But um, after doing some research on it, it just didn't taste that good. It didn't hold up that well. <laughs> and so it was uh, one of Willie Adams, who you see in the back room with the coat on, one of his only failed uh, business ventures. This is an image that um, was always powerful. Um, yeah, if you look about eight rows up, you see a brother right there who was uh, the first to graduate, but the sixth to go to the Naval Academy. So it's like, imagine being, his name is slipping me right now, and I don't have my notes with me, but um, imagine being his brother and being in that class at the Naval Academy. And I think, uh, so you know, this is an image um, that definitely feels in, and a lot, a lot of times now there's a, there's a name for the Great Migration, which, which kind of coins with what I've recently learning spanned, you know, 70, 80 years. And um, this image just has that feel of it. And it took me a while to look at, you know, she's playing a bass and that stick at the bottom kind of reverberates and gives you that sound. But this is another image, a lot of the images that aren't identified. Of course, this is um, Don Newcomb, Campanella, and Jackie Robinson. And a lot of the images are identified. But this is an image that also, we talk about legacy, that's my Uncle Frank, who is, who is now an ancestor. And this is an early Photoshop. He's pulling the wagon that he's in. And my grandfather, as going through the collection, I saw the three images that he put together and took to be able to kind of mend this image together. And it was always something I had enjoyed. I'm just gonna flip through here. This is another image where, I mean, my favorite part is this kid with the aviator glasses, drinking three straws. If you look closely, this guy's weighing out a fish, two and five eighths. And he's also got a fish like right on the front that he's about to probably fillet soon. Early recycling, these two young men with the goat. So oyster men, huge oyster hall. This is uh, Paul Robeson picking in front of uh, Forest Theater in Baltimore. Let's see. It's the NAACP Freedom Train. And there's so many images like this. I got, when I think of someone like this, this gentleman's maybe grandson or, or daughter or cousin, they might not have an image of him similar to this one or have one that's, that's crumbling. Um, so usually, Lately, what I've been trying to do is really show the importance of keeping your family's legacy together. If someone, if you have a family member that has, you know, a box of photos somewhere in a closet or somewhere, go scan them, go talk with them, go find out who the people are in, them, in, in the images, take some notes, you know, get them, get them online, get them digitized so you can share them with family members so the history is preserved. Because if you don't, there's a possibility it could be lost. And I'm gonna flip through a few more and then uh, go ahead and flip through. It's also another image that always um, kind of struck me. A lot of the images he shot were candid and a lot were posed. This is definitely one that of course was a posed image, but people tended to take the photographs in the part of their house that they felt were, that they kind of wanted to flex. So this was, this was, this family clearly all about reading You'll see folks that take it around the piano or they'll take it in front of the new TV or um, in the backyard if they have you know, a ton of flowers in the backyard. And you, sometimes you'll actually see these families grow. You'll run into pictures where you see these kids at five years old, at 10 years old, at 12 years old, because these families wanted to preserve those legacies. I'm gonna end it with this photo. Um, this is actually a photo of my grandfather on the left and three gentlemen. There was a point where a lot of diplomats were coming from overseas and upon going up and down Route 40, um, Route 40, uh, the racism in this country was making us look bad. And so they dressed up as African diplomats to see if they could be served in the restaurants that wouldn't serve African-Americans. 
And there's a story, I think it's Afro Wild, what is that story's name? Do you remember the story? It's, I think, Afro reporters bring wild comedy to um, something. Email me, I'll send you the story. Um, but yeah, they went up and down, and they went to maybe a dozen restaurants. They got a, they got a limousine from a funeral home, and they got both, all three of these guys are reporters, I'm pretty sure, except for my grandfather. And they kind of just went up and down to kind of see what the story is about. And we have this story because there was a story written about it in the newspaper. So it's like, this, it's preserved. But at the same time, these images really, really bring them to life. And I can only imagine being there on that day and the stories that they would have to tell after this. And I'm going to go ahead and um, leave it at that. All right. Thank you all. Wasn't that amazing? I don't know what I'm gonna do with myself now. That's a beautiful, let's give them another round of applause for these artists. We're gonna start with a conversation with the artist. I'm gonna start with the general question. Um, and when did you start your process and why? And we'll start with uh, Larry at the end. So the process, it was a um, bit of an evolution, if you will. Um, and like the proposal that I submitted was very different from what I actually started making. In part, you know, I had a, a loss in my family, so I was in a really um, vulnerable place. And um, you know, I couldn't really work creatively uh, through the proposal that I submitted. So. I just knew that I needed to kind of use this project as a way to kind of heal and kind of process what I was going through. And just wanted to go to the South and, you know, document these places in which my um, family members, you know, traveled. And um, from there, you know, me and my dad began to kind of bond and connect on discovering this information as he did know a lot about his family history as well. Um, so that led to different conversations and then um, began to address issues around our relationship. And then the kind of the concept um, in terms of the work was kind of born out of that, so. I guess I'm, am I next? <laughs> um, process of, of the essay or just my work in general? Yeah, I, I wrote that this summer, but, um, and I've never written something as long as this before. But, I mean, I've written essays in college that were really bad, but um, I think the process, I realized I was thinking that I always thought that I was never doing research, but really, I've been thinking about these things for a long time. I just never spoke about it to anyone. And this summer, I think going with my mom and my aunt to Panama to help my grandmother move, there was just such a density of emotion and care. And it just felt, I felt like, I needed to get, I needed to articulate it. And I still, I feel like it's really become a kind of personal project now of mine. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would, I think that's kind of interesting. You mentioned healing and then place as a kind of trigger for these memories coming through also, or a way of processing it, um, which I think is really important also for my process of doing everything. Um, that I, I think I started thinking about, I've always been thinking about family legacies because it's just something that gets talked about in our family, where it's like, you gotta know who all these people are, you gotta know the family tree, here's the family Bible, here's the, you know, like all this stuff, here's what this person did. So you have a sense of like some of that already growing up. But then, you know, at some, some point, I think art became a way to investigate some of those questions in a, in a different way, where you do get to kind of explore ideas and make something new from it that is your representation, your experience of those thoughts. Um, and so maybe 2010 or so, I was making work about uh, my grandfather on the West Coast and I, when I was living there. And then when I moved to Chicago and then moved back to LA, I was like, oh, wait a minute, he was in Chicago. And I learned that like some of the stuff I had been handling and touching were from places that I was spending a lot of time in in Chicago. So that recognition of like my physical body has been moving through the same exact streets that he's been, that he was photographed on. I'm like, holding that piece of history. When I came back to it, you know, then I had a different sense of like what it meant to be in those spaces. 
So the place really triggered the meaning for me. And similarly, coming back here to Baltimore has, I'm like deep, deep, deep into the Baltimore and the Maryland history because of being here. So I think the place always kind of like gets your brain working in a different way when you can take up space and have a more visceral sense of like what these people's um, you know, lived experience was. And then you can embody it in a different way and get really close and intimate to that history. I don't know if that really, okay. <laughs> um, for myself, it feels like I've been taking photos my whole life. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, from, I remember taking photos almost at like what feels like three and four, five years old, um, but not really, it becoming kind of maybe like a side hustle. Is people would hit me up and ask me to, um, to take photos and I almost, kind of was taking photography for granted because it was it was right next to me so much that I didn't really see the importance of it until a little bit later on when I was teaching and um, a friend of mine gave an assignment to his class to gather stories from the elders and their families and then bring them back and share them with the class. And he had spent a lot of time trying to find images of the community that these elders were, were speaking of and when it was thriving and he had a hard time. And that was, I just began to really start scanning negatives. I maybe had two or 300 negatives scanned at that point. Um, and this was 2008, but we, we found a bunch of negatives in, in what was the late 90s. But the technology and just the time, time consuming aspect of it, I hadn't really dove into it and my father hadn't either. And when these kids saw the images, the re their reaction is what kind of lit the fire under me and said that this is a time sensitive project and we need to gather the information around these photos, um, you know, kind of for generations to come. So that was kind of the catalyst for me um, as far as getting into the project. Great answers. Um, I'd also like to know for Larry and uh, Webster, how do people respond when you start to talk about your grandfather or the your manhood or just your sensitivity that's connected to the photos? It's been probably the most rewarding aspect of, of the exhibition and the work. I mean, it's been a lot of emotional responses. Um, during the opening, I had a few people that walked up to me in tears, being able to kind of connect and relate, um, just kind of appreciating me being vulnerable and sharing that story. and. Um, since then, I've received personal emails saying the same thing. Um, so it's just, you know, it just, um, I don't know, it just kind of reinforces um, or reaffirms, you know, the, the reason I made the work. You know, you hope that it has an impact and to kind of to see it in this way um, based on inter interactions with people. It's just been amazing. Um. I feel some of the same, I mean, a lot of the images, the beauty, what I think of, um, of the archive is that it really shows a wide range. It shows the joy, it shows the pain, it shows the ups, it shows the downs, it shows the families, it shows a little bit of everything. And I feel like there's something in there that everyone can connect with, um, which is the power of, of photography and the power of legacies and the power of memories. Um, so that's just kind of where it, Savannah, I'd like to know how you connect with Martha. I saw her writing, I heard you talk about women's suffrage, so I really want to know, and I want you to share, just finding the pictures and just that journey with her in the land. Yeah, I mean, I think it's if you, I've found that if you keep asking the questions and you're like curious and keep digging, stuff will just surface that you weren't even expected. Like that eBay picture, what? <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, where, where did you come from? Somebody sent me that. And one of our, my board members sent this to me and was like, can you believe they have this on eBay? And I was like, wait, what? Like, I need to get this. And what else is out here, you know? And so I think, um, so in that sense, it's like a, definitely there's a spiritual element to it. And I think there's definitely like an unspoken spiritual element to ancestral, I mean, to archival practice that we should talk about more. Because sometimes when I'm walking down those aisles and like all the boxes are there, they're stuffed with people's stories. Like there's three million photographs in the collection. So that's like probably at least three million people because we, I mean, we have some that are multiples, but then there's images that have 10 people in them, you know? So 
imagining just how many ancestors are represented within that collection. When you're there, they're like, pick me, pick me, pick me, talk about me, you know? Um, but with Martha, it's just been such an amazing exploration because it's not like the information isn't there for her. I mean, some of it's not, some of it I haven't found yet, but it's just, it really was about like the curiosity and going after it and like just being kind of relentless in the search. And I'm in that place right now with her mother where I'm like pretty relentless about trying to find some image of her. Cause I'm like, if you're, if you lived on the, the land that you were enslaved on and then you came to own it and your husband has a portrait of him because he was like that dude, like there's gotta be a photo of you somewhere. You know what I mean? Like, so that's, I don't know. So I'm just searching them out and feeling really grateful that they seem to be coming forward. And in some ways, because I haven't found her mom yet, I'm like, maybe she doesn't want to be found. You know, maybe she wants to actually just like, like leave me out of it, you know? So trying to respect that boundary also. Elisa, uh, I have a question about the archive and the, that you collected from your grandfather mm -hmm. and the, the whole process for you. Um, what, what do you think he was feeling as he transitioned? When he passed away? When he passed Oh, I don't know. He didn't have a will, so I think he was, he thought he was going to keep living. <laughs> mm. It happened very suddenly, and sadly, a lot of his stuff,